So our first presenter, uh, so our presenters have been given another five minutes. And uh, we'll be a little lenient, and then we'll hopefully preserve 30 minutes for Q&A as we did the last time. Our first presenter probably needs no introduction, but I have one here. <laughs> Charles Curran, a Roman Catholic priest and the Elizabeth Skurlock University Professor of Human Values at Southern Methodist University. Uh, he is an expert on fundamental moral theology, social ethics, the role of the Catholic Church as moral and political actor in society, and a lot more, Catholic moral theology, and a lot more. He is the author of numerous books and articles, including Catholic Moral Theology in the United States, A History, recently at Georgetown University Press, 2008. Loyal Descent, Memoir of a Catholic Theologian, Georgetown, 2006. He received his bachelor's from St. Bernard's College, the seminary, <coughs> Diocese of Rochester, is that right? Mm -hmm. And his STL and STD from the Pontifical Gregorian University. Uh, person that directed the office where I worked, uh, Jack Hodgkin, knew Charlie during those years in Rome and had a great affection for Charlie. And uh, an undying affection, I would say, in support for Charlie. He has a second STD in moral theology from Academia Alfonsiana. Charlie was the first recipient of the John Courtney Murray Award. Like Peter, he was president of Catholic Theological Society of America. Like Peter, he has been president of American Theological Society. And he's been president of the Society for Christian Ethics. Charlie. Thank you, John. There really should be a subtitle for the, uh, this panel. The subtitle is People Who Don't Know a Darn Thing About Interreligious Dialogue. <laughs> 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 they dress it up, but that's the basic meaning. <laughs> so we should start by professing my ignorance. But I was so happy when the uh, when Jared asked me if I would participate in this, I said, I, you know, I, I love Peter, I got a great re respect for Peter, but I, I really am not in the interreligious dialogue and the world Christianity. And then uh, he said, well, we're celebrating his legacy. You can come and celebrate his legacy. Said, All right. But then I thought, you know, I might be able to contribute something about his legacy that no one else has even mentioned today. And I think part of the enduring legacy of Peter C. Fan is the fact that he engaged in an institution, in controversy with an institution that has existed over 500 years, starting with the name of the Inquisition, <laughs> then the Holy Office, then the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and he emerged triumphant. <laughs> there are very few people. <laughs> that is an historical fact. <laughs> Alternative fact. <laughs> <laughs> and the history part of it is, is very simple. On July 20th, 20, uh, 2005, he received a letter from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, pointing out in seven pages the serious ambiguities and doctrinal problems with his book. And uh, they asked him at the time then that uh, he was supposed to write an article uh, correcting these errors. Uh, have it vetted by the <coughs> congregation and publish it in a theological journal. Peter uh, did talk to his local bishop, but he finally heard nothing and he wrote the congregation on April 4, 2006 to Cardinal William Levada, then the, uh, then the uh, prefect of the CDF. And uh, uh, that Peter's letter, <laughs> 
is a classic. That man is not only bright, but he's clever, astute, and cunning. So be careful. Never get in a fight with Peter or you lose. All right. So Peter uh, wrote this letter and said, I accept under three conditions. And the first is that the, he asked the prohibition to reprint the book be revoked because such a prohibition presumes his guilt before having the opportunity to defend himself. To think that they would even give any respect to a principle of justice, but anyway. <laughs> uh, secondly, he requested clarification about the nature and scope of the article. And third, as a matter of justice, he requested the congregation to consider a fair and just remuneration for the work that he would have to do in composing the new article. That's the factual situation. Now what I want to do is go through three major points in the paper. We, we want a world religious our Trinitarian, so there are three points. Uh, uh, the first is, why did they choose to investigate Peter? Secondly, why did they end the investigation without ever having criticized him or condemned him? <laughs> and third, what does that say about the processes of the congregation? So first, why did they investigate Peter Fan? That's a rather easy answer. That basically, as we heard yesterday, the efforts of the congregation had been heavily centered in an earlier period on moral theology, sexuality, marriage, and liberation theology. Mm -hmm. But then in the latter part of the uh, 20th century, the new issue came along of the salvific element in uh, world religions. And this was brought to the fore in the famous document from the congregation, Dominus Jesus, in uh, 2000. And a number of people yesterday talked about Dominus Jesus. Uh, then this was, uh, uh, in conjunction with that, it was also mentioned yesterday in the famous lecture that Cardinal Ratzinger gave to the Latin American bishops in uh, 1996. He explicitly condemned two persons, John Hick, uh, who, an Anglican, and a former colleague of, uh, where are we back then? Uh, uh, and uh, that uh, Paul Knitter, who was teaching then at uh, Xavier University. Knitter had been a religious priest, but had left and married and was teaching at uh, Xavier University. So he was explicitly mentioned by Ratzinger in that lecture. Uh, then in 2001, the Holy Office came out with their investigation of the book of Jacques Dupuy from Rome, uh, pointing out again his errors and ambiguities, and ultimately took action against him. Nothing, the action basically was that he had to accept their general thesis if a book was to be republished or translated, it had to put in the book the remarks of the congregation. But they took no uh, personal penalties against him. Then in 2004, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith uh, investigated and took serious action against Roger Haight. Mm -hmm. Roger Haight, a Jesuit, uh, who actually at that time was teaching at Union Theological in New York, but they said that unless and until he changed his teaching, he could not teach Catholic theology. So we have this very interesting thing then of these condemnations, and along comes Peter Fane. He had no choice. <laughs> I mean that uh, it was obvious they were going to get Peter Fane. <laughs> that here was a very prominent American theologian uh, who was best known for his work on interreligious dialogue and uh, pluralism and world Christianity. So it was obvious that Peter was in the radar and was going to be investigated. First point, simple. Now the second. Uh, why did the CDF drop 
the investigation without ever criticizing him or condemning him. That's an amazing thing, you see. Uh, I, I gave the detail. After Peter wrote back, he never heard from the congregation again. Now what they did, uh, you know, they didn't want to admit they lost. Oh, God help us, no. Uh, so they passed it off to the American bishops to take care of. But basically they admitted they could do nothing to Peter. Fascinating. After they had done all this to all these other people. Now why? Why was it that they decided they could do nothing against Peter? Well, we got to put a few academic qualifications in here. Uh, first of all, uh, who knows what the mind of the congregation of the <laughs> doctrine of the faith is? Uh, I don't even think God knows. <laughs> and if she does, she ain't telling. <laughs> uh, that I think that is uh, who knows. All we can try to do is to judge on the basis of other actions why it was that they decided that Peter won and they couldn't get Peter fast. I propose two reasons. Again, conjecture, not to, uh, you, you can't have absolute uh, understandings here. If theology can't be absolute, certainly trying to figure out what the CDF is can't be absolute either. But, uh, that I think two things uh, 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 occasion this as to why they couldn't get Peter. The first one was the condition that he raised to them in his letter. As I say, you're dealing with an Asian, a Vietnamese who's cunning, shrewd, and astute. <laughs> and look at that condition. Peter said, oh, I'm willing to do it provided you pay my salary for six months. <laughs> and I must say, I think in his latest book, Peter admits to being a little defensive about this. Peter said that some people accused him of being in so enculturated into the United States that he was now an enculturated capitalist. <laughs> That's true. Uh, that, uh, be that as it may, Peter said, that's not the case. Peter said, I'm looking for justice in this case. And the time might come when you have always dealt with just priests and religious who will always get a salary, will always get three squares, no matter what they're doing or not doing. But if we have lay people who are forced to do this, they would have to take a leave of absence from their work in order to spend the six months necessary to write this article. And therefore, he said, it's a matter of justice that the congregation should pay for this. Huh? What an astute, shrewd, cunning man Peter is. <laughs> he put the congregation between a rock and a hard place that, uh, that uh, obviously they weren't going to go along with it. But also, they didn't want to say publicly they weren't going to go along with it, that they'd be against justice. So it's a hot potato that they dropped. And I think that is part of the reason why Peter went scot-free. Uh, that smart and shrewd enough to raise that condition. Oh, I'll go along with you people. Just go along with my condition. Now, the second reason is uh, that if we look at history, uh, of all of this, we can find out why the congregation ultimately condemned some works and some people and done, didn't condemn Peter and a few others. And uh, if we just look at the history uh, that I mentioned already, that Dupuy uh, and Roger Haight were uh, severely condemned. In fact, Rogers, it turned out later, was even worse. Mm -hmm. Roger was forbidden to even teach theology at Union Theological Seminary. 
Now, what authority the congregation of the doctor of the faith has over union, I'll leave that to Serene, who runs the place. <laughs> uh, but that, uh, uh, that, that was the case. Uh, that uh, Dupuy, as I say, was defended very strongly by a number of the Jesuits, but uh, ultimately they did, you know, make their point that he had to accept a general statement and uh, print in any f future editions or translations the document from Rome. On the other hand, they never did anything against Paul Knitter. Paul Knitter, who was explicitly mentioned by name by Ratzinger as being guilty of pluralism and, and uh, 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 relativism, they never took any public action against him. There might have been some behind the scenes negotiations, mm -hmm. but there was never any public action against him. The interesting thing then, I think, uh, putting this together with some other aspects of things, uh, I remember when I was reading the letters to America in America Magazine. I was glancing through the July 30, 2007 issue of America in the letters to the editor. And I see this thing headed clarification. And the wording is, quote, I personally give religious assent to the church's teaching regarding the intrinsically evil acts as proposed in John Paul II's encyclical Veritatis Splendor. I personally give religious assent to the church's teaching regarding homosexuality contained in the catechism of the Catholic Church, etc. The clarification goes on to assert giving religious assent to three more Vatican documents. It is signed by Edward Vasek, SJ. It had nothing to do with anything that ever appeared in America Magazine. <laughs> Obviously, the Vatican insisted he had to publish this clarification. <coughs> and in, in a, a marvelous article that uh, Brad Hinsey has written, has written and appeared originally in Horizons magazine, he talks about a couple other cases. And uh, the other uh, uh, cases that he mentioned involved the disciplining of Catholic theologians uh, by the CDF with regard to two Jesuit theologians, John Sachs and Paul Crowley, who again had to give clarifications about their position on homosexuality, saying they gave religious assent to the official teaching of the church. And interestingly enough, as Hinsey points out, uh, that Crowley uh, uh, and Stephen Pope, who was a lay theologian from Boston College, in the same issue of Theological Studies, both wrote on homosexuality. Crowley's essay did not even call the official teaching wrong or into question. But he was forced to give a clarification. Pope, the layperson who said the teaching was wrong, was never condemned, never told that he had to uh, assert his religious assent to this teaching. All right, if we look at all this now historically, what we can come to the conclusion is that uh, the Vatican congregation will take action when they know it will be effective. You don't use your, you will lose your authority if you make authoritative decisions that are not effective. <laughs> They've been around 500 years. They know that, huh? Okay. So, uh, and, and so if you look at the record, there are many other things, but I don't have time to go into them all. But I, 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 uh, but I think they would also verify my thesis that uh, that the Vatican would always work when you could work through the religious superior, mm -hmm. and that way you can attack the individual person by working through the religious severe. And that, uh, that is what, what has happened in many situations, the examples I gave here. Also, interesting enough, if you look, 
there has never been action taken against a Catholic theologian at a major American university. Now you might question what's major, what isn't, but uh, that's the fact. Obviously the Vatican knows it wouldn't have any effect because the major Catholic universities say they practice academic freedom and that no outside force, church, or anything else can have any effect on what goes on in a first-class American university. Okay, two minutes. And the canny Peter Fan comes along. And in his original thing, Peter said, you know, I don't like publicity. I'm not making this public. But I had to tell the president of Georgetown, the dean of, uh, of the uh, arts and sciences at Georgetown, and the chair of the department about this. He made sure they knew he was at Georgetown University. <laughs> In his own way. So at that stage, I'm sure the congregation said, we can't touch him. We're not going to do anything about it. And that Peter helped the situation along by his able to deal with it in a very shrewd way. So as a result, he emerged unscathed and he beat the Holy Office. <laughs> Final uh, point, very quickly, my third point. The processes that the congregation uses are terribly unjust. And that and we have to say this publicly because they're still being used against people, mm -hmm. uh, not only in this country, but abroad. Mm -hmm. Let me just mention a few quick things. First of all, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith is prosecutor, judge, and jury. Mm -hmm. That's it. Prosecutor, judge, and jury. Second, the person who's accused has no right to a, their own lawyer. They have no right to see the evidence, et cetera. The so-called Brady uh, thing of the, uh, the Brady law in this country in 1963. Cliff Bamberger, who taught at this university a bit, uh, was, the, was the lawyer, but just died a few weeks ago. Anyway. Uh, saying that prosecutors had to give to the defendant all the information, including that that might exculpate the, the defendant. Anyhow, that totally unjust in that. Second injustice, they, uh, the first stage of their process is run by con consultants. The consultants are all 99% the, uh, the theologians teaching at Roman University who represent one school of thought. They do not represent the total picture of Catholic theology in the world today. Third and finally, the, if, if, uh, if a system is uh, also unjust, if it is not justly applied, obviously this is not justly applied. It's only applied to people whom they think they can get. And it's unjust on that score. So, the legacy of Peter Fan, he beat the city. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Thank you very much, Charlie. Our next presenter is Brian Flanagan, who's an associate professor of theology and religious studies at Marymount University nearby here. Flanagan researches, uh, research focuses on ecclesiology, ecumenism, and Jewish-Christian dialogue, particularly through the Ecclesiological Investigations Network, which Gerard has had a big role in, and, and Brian himself too. And the, and the um, American Academy of, and the Ecclesiological Investigations Group within the American Academy of Religions. He teaches the Foundational Theological Inquiry course and upper level courses in Ecclesiology, Christology, and Sacramental Theology. He graduated from Catholic University of America and his MA and PhD are from Boston College. Brian. Thank you.
So one of the dangers of studying a figure like Peter Fawn is that one always sees what one wants to see and tends to lift out of a wider theological career the things that interest you. So it won't surprise you that when I look down at the bottom of the well, I see the pig figure of Peter Fawn, ecclesiologist, staring back up at me. I'm not going today to figure out the, the well-worn argument about the difference between the historical Peter Fawn and the Peter Fawn of belief um, that's, that's in the birth certificates and all of these things. But I want to lift out some of the distinctiveness of Peter's ecclesiological vision um, by highlighting three related qualities of the church and of the ecclesiology that study it that Peter is promoted in his writing. A church in an ecclesiology that is regnocentric or kingdom focused, a church in an ecclesiology that is dialogical, and a church in an ecclesiology that is canonic. Two comments first about his ecclesiological method. Like all of his theology, Fawn is rooted deeply in context, betwixt and between as these contexts may be. And in particular, in his writings in the church, Fawn draws deeply, oh, thank you. Fawn draws deeply from the wells of Asian ecclesiology, and especially as expressed in statements of the Federation of Asian Bishops Conferences and that body's Office of Theological Concerns. And Asian ecclesiological reflections on a new way of being church, particularly as expressed in the documents of the FABC, provide, I think, you can argue, the crucial context for Fawn's reflections on the church. Secondly, from that context, one notices not only what topics and questions Fawn raise for our, raises for our attention, but what topics he and other Asian ecclesiologists tend to leave out. He's written that the topics most often absent in Asian ecclesiology, topics that are often the primary focus of many European and North American ecclesiological texts, are things like papal primacy and infallibility, apostolic succession, magisterium, episcopal power, hierarchical structure, canon law, the Roman curia, and the like. Fan shies away from these churchy issues, as he calls them. These are rooted in his ecclesiology, but I also think they indicate something important about Peter himself. With no disrespect intended to my fellow ecclesiologists or to Peter, we might ask where Peter has been swimming. He writes in his correspondence with Cardinal Leveda, recently published, you can purchase this outside as well, with all the, that he is, quote, a very small fish in the theological pond, a tiny minnow, as it were. I might rather compare Peter to one of those deep sea fish, those with the fortitude, the strong bones, and the thick skin to reach some of the deeper questions in ecclesiology by comparison to those of us splashing around in the relatively shallower depths of ecclesiological polity. Peter points us in the church away from the quote unquote easy questions of papal primacy and Episcopal authority to the deep water ecclesiological question of what the church is and what it is called to be in the service of the reign of God. So to these three characteristics, a church in ecclesiology that is regnocentric, dialogical, and canonic. The call of the church to serve the reign of God is on its face uncontroversial. 50 years after the Second Vatican Council, the idea of distinguishing the church from the reign of God, of understanding the church as but the initial budding forth of the reign of God or the kingdom now present in mystery, to quote Lumen Gentium, is in many, if not most areas of the church, happily received. But such a distinction comes with consequences, particularly with regard to understanding and studying the church primarily in terms of its function in the history of salvation, rather than by questions of its identity. As Fawn writes, what the church is is determined by what it must do. Its essence is defined by its function. Before looking more at Peter's words, I want to outline a concept developed by Neil Ormrod that I find helpful in explaining the importance of what Peter has been up to in most of his writing on the church. It may seem like a bit of ecclesiological, or even more dangerous, Lonerganian jargon, but sometimes a complicated reality requires a complicated vocabulary. And Wormrod's theory tries to give some systematic precision to this, this aspect of the church's reality. In his book, Revisioning the Church, Wormrod draws on Bernard Lonergan and Robert Duran to discuss integrator and operator functions in the church. That is, the limiting institutions, symbols, and narratives that point to the conservation of past values and establishment of identity, and those that push ahead that transform or attempt to transform the current situation. Helpful of simplifying shorthand for the ecclesial integrator function might be ecclesial identity. 
while for the operator function we might use mission. We have a rich ecclesiological vocabulary when we talk about ecclesial identity, and especially many of these churchy issues. But Armorod talks about the absence relatively in both our models of the church, our images of the church, and our discussion of the church of the operator function, the question of what the church should be doing. Some of that is very interestingly, why, did, why? why don't we focus so much on this? Some of it's probably historical an accident of the vagaries of Western European history, a luxury of working in a primarily Christian society, a byproduct for Catholics of the ultramontanist strategies of survival in the 19th century. But for today, I'd also like to add the particular anxieties for identity and connection, for integration into a community, that the stronghold those desires have in places like North American and European contexts and late capitalist consumerist secular age. Among other things, consumerist culture fosters increased anxiety about who you are, where you stand in relation to others and to the wider community, and what you can or should do in that situation to improve your odds of finding yourself or finding your ideal partner or community of belonging. It does that because it wants to sell you the products that will either fill that need for identity or the need for community, and will continue to stimulate dissatisfaction with those identities because if you stop attempting to find yourself or find your ideal community, you stop consuming quite so frenetically. Christianity, as well as other religious traditions and serious non-religious forms of human pursuit, rightly presents a pathway to an alternative source of identity beyond consumer consumption. An identity in a community that cannot be bought and sold can be, for late modern people in a secular age in the global north, a way off the carousel of anxiety. And yet, as Vincent Miller argues in Consuming Religion, the structures of consumer society run not only out in the world out there, but run within us and within the church. In this context, our northern hunger for identity and for community can providentially be satisfied by the new identity in Christ and perhaps by the community of the church. But the shadow side of this good, is, in this context at least, is that since identity is received as a deliverance, there is a greater temptation to focus upon the integrator function of the church rather than the operator function of the church, on identity over mission. The joy of being given identity and community in Christ in a consumer culture tempts us to focus upon who the church is rather than what the church is called to do, upon integrator over operator, or upon identity over mission. And a quick look at what church people, and particularly ecclesiologists, spend their time writing about and arguing about suggest that this is true across many of the ideological, traditional, progressive divisions <coughs> in Christian churches. In his work, Peter Fawn, ecclesiologist, points us gently, and sometimes not so gently, away from the integrator function of the church to the operator function, as does, conveniently, Pope Francis. A regnocentric church and a regnocentric ecclesiology fosters a moving away from the church out intra to the church out extra from self-absorption to mission. Such a regnocentric church is by nature missionary that is directed outward to the world and missionary not primarily to the world or to the peoples of Asia in which this concept is most elaborate in Fon's work, but missionary work among and with the people, with the world, its peoples, and its religious traditions. <coughs> Focusing on the kingdom of God as a shared center of gravity opens up space for the forms of being religious interreligiously and for collaborating in our work for the kingdom that Fawn promotes in his work. At the same time, however, that it changes how we think of other religious believers, it also fundamentally challenges how we think about the church and does so without conjuring up, necessarily, the boogeyman of religious relativism or indifferentism. It especially influences the practical life of the church when in the messiness of actual historical life, choices must be made about what programs, forms of institutions, and activities best serve the reign of God. Fawn leaves open a question that should challenge those of us who spend time studying or strengthening the integrator functions of the church. He writes, real life does not always allow an easy choice between the church and the reign of God, and not every decision in favor of the church promotes the reign of God. When push comes to shove, what is to be favored? <clears throat> the reign of God or the church? His rethinking of priorities leads to the next characteristic that he highlights, the church as dialogical. Fan's concept of the church as dialogical, like 
the idea of a regnocentric church is on its surface relatively uncontroversial, given that promoting dialogue, even if sometimes observed only in the breach, has been a constant of ecclesial vocabulary for the past 50 years. But again, Peter has gone deeper in exploring these ecclesiological implications of this. And this he draws upon the triple dialogue developed within Asian Catholic theology, especially dialogue with the Asian people, especially the poor, with their cultures and with their religions. But he takes this further, connecting the reality of multiple forms of dialogue with the churchy topic of the magisteria, plural, of the church. In addition to the Episcopal magisterium of the bishops of the church, and the theological magisterium we theologians love to claim for ourselves, Peter highlights three additional magisteria, the magisterium of the lay faithful, the magisterium of the poor, and the magisterium <coughs> of believers of other religions. In addition to the classical topic of the census fide and fidelium and the lay magisterium, he writes movingly of the special role of the poor as teachers of the faith. It is the magisterium of the poor, he writes, Christians and non-Christians, that can teach us more effectively and persuasively than any other church magisterium <coughs> how to be a disciple of Jesus today. And again, without the magisterium of the poor, Christian as well as non-Christian, who are the living icons of Jesus the crucified and the object of God's preferential love, the teachings of bishops and theologians about God and the crucified will be no more than a noisy gong and clanging cymbal. Finally, and based upon the emphasis on real dialogue found in the Asian context, Fon suggests that the church has something to learn from believers of other religions. Those who accept with humility, he writes, and gratitude the magisterium of the pagans can bear witness to their goodness and holiness of life, the truth of their teachings, the nobility of their ethics, and the transformative power of their spirituality. Fon's reimagination of the multiple magisteria of the church encourages real multiple dialogues within the church, rather than a carefully disguised monologue or an impoverished dialogue between two groups of competing theological experts or elites. From this, we can turn to the third and probably the most interesting and challenging characteristic Fon, the ecclesiologist, highlights, the church as canonic. As I've noted, while Fon is distinguished in the way he expresses the previous two, calls for the church to be focused on the kingdom of God and to be dialogical or relatively commonplace. If you go to an ecclesiologist and say the, the church should focus on the reign of God and be more dialogical, there's sort of a, yes, yes, we should do that. We should really get on this. But Fon's radicalism comes in when he talks about canonic ecclesiology, a church that in its service to the kingdom and missionary dialogue has the courage to imitate its Lord by dying to itself so that the reign of God might live. Writing about the church in Asia, Fon states, it is only by bearing witness to and serving the reign of God among the Asian peoples and not by expanding its membership and social political influence that the church will truly become Asian. To be truly church, the Asian church paradoxically must cease to be church. That is, it must empty itself and cease to exist for its own sake for the service of a higher reality, namely the kingdom of God. What Fonz is about the church in Asia can hardly be said about the church, period. And so let me rephrase it. To be truly church, the church paradoxically must cease to be church. It must empty itself and cease to exist for its own sake. Here I think we see the more radical ecclesiological engine that is driving much of the rest of Peter's conception of the church. To return to Ormerod's concept, here we see the possibility of a church whose operator function, whose mission, is its only integrator function? Is this desirable or even possible? And you can raise a number of questions here. One could argue this is not how human institutions or societies work. Even if historically we may have overemphasized the formation of identity over mission, it's pos is it possible for a community to serve the kingdom without having some form of identity, some form of integrating reality, however minimal or weakly claimed? Second, the idea of a church that loses itself runs headlong into a history of the church in which the claim to identity and power has defined epics of church history and seemed crucial to generations of bishops, theologians, and the lay faithful. It seems possible and possibly providential that only in the Asian context in which the church is such a stark minority could one even conceive of a church that helps the kingdom appear through its own disappearance. Third, in this secular age of the global north especially, 
That trajectory runs against some of the major fears for identity, community, and stability that fracture life in our modern consumerist societies. And yet, we seem to be running up against a possibly new insight into the mystery of the church, where the paradox of the kenosis of Christ might yet help us understand the paradox of a kenotic church. It's possible the church is called to lose its life so as to save it, and that by taking on John the Baptist's faith, it may be called to decrease that the kingdom might increase. A resource here might be some of the eschatological imagination we discussed this morning. It might be um, von Balthasar's explorations of the word of God losing its identity in Holy Saturday almost to the breaking point so as to receive its identity anew in the risen Christ. And in the first pass of this concept, and with limited time, I have still have difficulty imagining what this would look like and how deeply it would change the way in which we, not only in Asia, but also here in North America, do church. Nevertheless, and perhaps not without some surprise on all of our parts, Peter's vision seems to be where the successor of Peter is going. For looking for a church which is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it has been out on the streets rather than a church which is uh, safe and sheltered. All of this suggests to me, first of all, that Peter is onto something. No shocker there. Second, that we have a lot more work to do. And that third, we owe an ironic debt of gratitude, notwithstanding the real suffering involved, to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and the US Bishops Committee on Doctrine for providing Peter the bittersweet stimulus for expanding on these ideas in greater depth. Thank you. Very nicely done. Brian, very nicely done. So if somebody were to say to you, I'd like to introduce you to Gerard Mannion, your response would be, Gerard Mannion, he's an institution, what do you mean? <laughs> he is the Joseph and Winifred Amaturo Chair here in Catholic Studies in the Department of Theology at Georgetown University, and a Senior Research Fellow at the Berkeley Center, where his work focuses on the role of the church in the world on social ethics and on ecumenical and interreligious dialogue. Gerard has published widely in the fields of ecclesiology, ethics, and public theology, as well as in other fields of systematic theology and philosophy. He is the founding chair of the Ecclesiological Investigations International Research Network. His numerous books include Pope Francis and the Future of Catholicism, Evangelii Gaudium, and His Papal Agenda. 2017, so it's come out, right? Just about. Just yeah. about. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. But. <laughs> <laughs> Where we dwell in common pathways for dialogue in the 21st century, the Rutledge Companion to the Christian Church, which he edited with Lewis Mudge, Catholic Social Justice, Theological and Practical Explorations, which he co-edited with Philomena Cullen and Bernard Hoos, Ecclesiology and Postmodernity, Questions for the Church in Our Times, and Schopenhauer, Religion and Modernity. He is edit also editor of the Bloomsbury Publishing Series, Ecclesiological Investigations, and senior editor with Oxford University's Mark Chapman of Palgraves Macmillan's Pathways for Ecumenical and Interreligious Dialogue. Gerard Mannion. Thanks very much, John. Um, so originally I was planning to cover some of the same ground that Charlie did, but Charlie did it so well, um, I'm not going to repeat what Charlie said, and also some of the things that Brian spoke about, but Brian did it so well, I'm hopefully not going to repeat that and offer something that's uh, a little complimentary to, to both, I hope. Uh, I'm going to talk about Peter Fan and the Copernican Revolution in Ecclesiology. Just over 10 years ago, almost to the very week, Peter Pham presented a series of free prestigious lectures on his then recent trilogy of books in Liverpool, England. The series was named in honour of Georgetown's very own, the late Monica Helwig, who had recently died. Monica had led an amazing life, from a childhood in Germany to religious life and scholarship and teaching in the USA, with a spell in Rome as an unofficial advisor to one of the bishops at Vatican II. Her own list of achievements was truly amazing. But what not so many people would have realised is that Monica had trained as a social worker in Liverpool itself. Mm. Who better then to name that lecture series in honour of? Then based in Liverpool myself, I was the organiser of that series and hosted Peter, whose lectures were enthralling, hugely informative, and which had the audience each evening in three separate locations eating out of his hand. 
But we also wanted to show Pete to the city and culture of Liverpool and to allow as many of the local community and our students to be able to meet him as possible. So for example, we had planned to bring Peter to a St. Patrick's Day ball in the famous Adelphi Hotel in Liverpool, which had already seen better days in its early 20th century heights. But alas, Peter's tuxedo would remain in its cover. He was stranded in the US at the airport by snow and arrived long after the shamrocks had been wetted, much to our own and his deep disappointment. After all, Peter was sent as a young priest to improve his English in Ireland. So we like to take credit for all those many, many books and articles that emerged since. <laughs> but we did manage to take him to visit the local shared Anglican Catholic parish, an amazing experiment in ecumenical cooperation between two communities, to visit the work of the Passionist Religious Order among the poorest of the poor migrants in the city, to visit one of the oldest Chinatowns in the world, more than half the world's exports passed through Liverpool's docks in the 19th century, to see the rejuvenated area known as the Albert Dock and the historic Free Graces architectural wonders, the Walker Art Gallery, I think we went to the Walker Art Gallery, yeah. and of course he simply had to see the Beatles Museum. Right. <laughs> Everywhere Peter went he was fascinated by the people he met, no matter what their station in life, and he patiently made ample time for them all, and he was fascinated by the culture and communities he encountered. But perhaps one of the most revealing episodes of that trip, for me at least, was after a group dinner in a local restaurant one evening, following what was, if I recall rightly, Peter's very first lecture of the series. As the evening drew onward, I was conscious that Peter should be offered a choice to retire early, to perhaps take a leisurely walk, the mile or two back to the university where he was staying, or perhaps any other option that might suit him. This was a learned professor after all. Among those options I posed to him was the existence of a traditional style, old style pub across the road from the restaurant. I wanted to cover all options for this esteemed guest after all. But I was fairly sure the esteemed professor would most likely opt to retire and sleep the sleep of the just after a first talk that went down so tremendously well. So I was surprised when Professor Fan turned to me and said, second Peter impression of the day, Brian, Gerard, there's always time for another beer. <laughs> As an Irishman, I knew from that moment that Peter and I would be great friends. <laughs> and we enjoyed a long and memorable chat over the road about theology, the church, life itself, and many more topics besides that history, alas, will probably never know about because neither of us can recall them. <laughs> oh, although I think Peter did discover at least one or two other local beers before his visit had ended. But that was not the first time Peter and I had met in person. I had known Peter's work for many years as a student and then as a young professor in the UK. In fact, as, a, as I've said elsewhere in the, the first fresher for Peter Fan, so broad was the range of topics Peter has worked on, I once believed there were a multitude of Peter Fans working in the world of theology. <laughs> but the first time we met in person, although our paths had almost crossed a couple of times previously at the Toronto annual meeting of the AAR, was in 2003 at a conference hosted by the St Thomas More Catholic Chaplaincy Centre at Yale University. Appropriately for the theme of this panel today and for the subject matter with which Peter's latest book, The Joy of Religious Pluralism, available outside for $35. Uh, <laughs> do I get commission for that? Yes. <laughs> well, the, the, theme, the theme of the Yale conference was governance, accountability and the future of the Catholic Church. It had been organised to explore critical and constructive ways for the church in the wake of the avalanche of revelations of the clerical abuse scandal. There were many invited speakers for that conference, but one of the most innovative and constructive contributions, namely that offered by the learned Professor Fan, uh, I will touch upon in a short while. But first of all, which brings us back to the focus of Charlie's paper, I would like to recall how Edward Skillebex once said that the institutional church, to loosely paraphrase, seems to reserve the harshest treatment for those who give the most. A long line of theologians, among them Charlie, particularly from the late 1970s onwards, could testify to the truth of that claim. And Peter Fan, who himself has given his whole life to the church and to Catholic theology, could also testify to the same, as Charlie kept recounted for us. Peter too has suffered unjustly at the hands of misguided institutional ecclesial bureaucracy. When he found himself under investigation by the USCCB and the then the CDF, with particular regard to his book, Being Religious Into Religiously, this process dragged on from 2005 and 2007, and a negative fallout from it was felt by Peter long beyond that time. Throughout his own ordeal, which is recounted in this latest book, available from all good booksellers for $35, and which we have already heard about from Charlie, Peter conducted himself with the utmost dignity and decorum, good grace and magnanimity. He did not speak to the media, 
But nor did he shy away from, as Charlie told us, from resisting what was clearly a flawed process and an unjust system. Indeed, one would think he would have kept his head down in the aftermath of such an ordeal. But instead, he continued to speak out courageously for others who afterwards suffered similar fates in the church, such as John Sabrino in 2007, Roger Haight for the second time in 2008, and Elizabeth Johnson in 2011. Most recently, Peter went out of his way openly and publicly to defend another great Asian theologian, the Indian Jesuit Michael Amalados. And Peter did so in the most direct fashion possible. By following Pope Francis's own example of phoning and writing and emailing people directly, Peter Fan wrote an open letter addressed directly to Pope Francis himself. The reason for choosing the public medium, as Peter explained to the Pope, was because he feared a private letter might never reach his holiness. The letter was written in defence of Amalados, a friend of Peter's who could not speak openly on his own behalf, but also with regard to what Peter called the future of the Catholic Church in Asia and its theology. The letter extolled the full extent of Father Amalados' achievements and service to the Church, and Fan made clear he was not advocating an anything-goes defence of academic freedom, but he also pointed out that most Asian Catholic theologians are priests or religious and do not have the benefit of academic freedom or institutional support, and so therefore they cannot defend themselves in the way some of their so-called Western counterparts can. The CDF would know this well, Fan added. Then this brief letter gets to its key persuasive point, I believe, to quote, the future of the Catholic Church in Asia is at stake. Without a robust theology that can arise only in an atmosphere of academic freedom, intellectual creativity, moral integrity, and personal courage, the Catholic Church in Asia will be deprived of an effective tool to fulfill its mission. Dear Pope Francis, you will soon visit Asia. Please take this opportunity to say a word of deep appreciation to Father Amalados for his theological work and a word of strong encouragement to the younger Asian theologians. Please tell them that they should not be discouraged by what they see happening to their predecessors and that they should continue their theological work with creativity, courage and the joy of the gospel. Did Pope Francis receive the letter? Did he listen to Peter Fan's passionate plea? It's impossible to prove with any certainty, but I have heard from different and independent sources that not a great deal of time after that letter was written, Michael Amalados was in Rome and was summoned to appear at the CDF to meet with the prefect, Cardinal Muller. Those reports suggest that Pope Francis ordered the CDF to invite Father Amalados to a cordial lunch and a chat and to bring the whole matter to a close. There is no public evidence of this except for the fact that Father Amalados was not censured and continues his valuable ministry and scholarship to this day, and perhaps more telling still, the morning after his appointment with the CDF, he can celebrate Mass with Pope Francis himself in the Casa Santa Marta, <laughs> and while putting on their vestments, the Holy Father inquired with some humour as to how the previous day's meeting had gone. <laughs> and if you want to know what the Holy Father is alleged to have said, um, I'll see you at the reception afterwards. <laughs> now, Deborah Tinelli, in her excellent paper yesterday, spoke of Peter Fan as prophetic, and I think Brian has already touched on, on some of this, and I, I want to touch on this also. To return to Peter's contribution to the 2003 Yale Conference, his wonderful paper was entitled A Copernican Revolution in Ecclesiology, Lessons from the Global South. And for those who perhaps still might ask, why should the church in the Euro-North American world seek to learn from ways of being church developed elsewhere, the works of Peter C. Fan proves instructive in exemplary fashion, as Brian has illustrated. For Peter has shown in an oppressive array of publications how ecclesiologically fruitful it can be when we give significant attention to context and above all else to the theme of human liberation. Fan has also made a thoroughly convincing case why through focusing upon the ecclesial fault lines in the Church of Europe and North America, uncovered in the wake of the clerical abuse, sex abuse stand, scandals. He suggests that the problems uncovered and the disastrous tactics employed by bishops and diocesan personnel for dealing with offenders, and indeed by the Vatican, and their victims betrayed an ecclesiology that did not serve the Church well. By and large, it was a Church-centred ecclesiology where the institutional church takes priority above all else, above pastoral provision and care for the welfare of the faithful. He also pointed to the incontrovertible statistics that illustrate church stagnation in the so-called North and massive growth in church membership in the South. In the not very distant future, the vast majority of the world's Roman Catholics 
will be located in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Furthermore, he argues that it is not the church in other parts of the world, it's not that the church in other parts of the world is perfect and suffers from fewer problems than its sister churches in Europe and North America. It's simply that the churches elsewhere have had to take stock and have had to rethink their ecclesiologies in the light of very different situations and in the light of context-specific challenges. What has come about, Fan suggests, is nothing short of a Copernican revolution in ecclesiology, a revolution that the churches of the North must embrace or risk further decline. But what transformations come about in such a revolution? Fan's work in general, and here in particular, touches upon each of the major themes in liberation ecclesiology in an exemplary fashion and clearly shows their practical relevance and thus further and wider potential promise. Focusing upon the church in Asia, Fan points to how in recent years, helped by the work of the Federation of Asian Bishops Conferences, as Brian has mentioned, founded in 1970, as well as events such as the 1998 Asian Synod of Bishops and the emergent papal document Ecclesia in Asia, the church in Asia has constructively shifted its own focus and priorities. No longer is the institutional church at the heart of those priorities. This is the Copernican revolution. It's no longer the earth is seen as the center of the universe. After all, uh, instead, the kingdom of God or of heaven, as Brian has pointed out, comes first. After all, the word church only occurs in the gospels twice and then only in Matthew, whereas the theme of building a kingdom is a constant presence in all four gospels. Thus, as Peter Fan states, the church's constitution becomes regnocentric, as Brian has described, defined by the building of the kingdom of God rather than vice versa. A kingdom-centered ecclesiology works in accordance with kingdom-centered values and strives to promote these in the wider world. In several writings, Fan has explicated the ecclesiological implications of this shift away from an ecclesiocentric to a reign of God-centered ecclesial vision, arguing that, to quote, this single-minded and total commitment to the reign of God is the essential and distinctive feature of Christian social spirituality in general and of liberation spirituality in particular. It informs the way Christian social spirituality understands the ministry of the historical Jesus, the Trinity and the Incarnation. Fan speaks of the need for and the reality of an inter-multicultural theology informed by what he calls a seeing from the margins. Of course, this reminds us of the formative influence upon Christianity of generations of migrants in the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries as well, such as the African slaves here in the United States and Irish people fleeing famine first and forced away by economic necessity, second to hostile places such as Britain, where the phrase no blacks, no dogs, no Irish was as applicable in many churches as it was in boarding houses and workplaces. I have long held a theory, to go back to the focus of Charlie's paper, that for those theologians investigated, censured and treated unjustly at the hands of the institutional church since the 1970s, the main threat their ideas posed to alternative powers and perspectives in the church was not primarily, at least, what they had to say about moral theology and Redburn and issues such as sexuality, not what they had to say about Christology, not what they had to say about women in the church and feminist theology, not what they had to say about other faiths and religious pluralism. Rather, the most dangerous and threatening ideas of all were those that offered a new ecclesiological vision. Ideas that suggested the church could be understood, shaped, structured, ministered, and lived in very differing ways. Behind just about every single condemnation of Catholic scholars in that long period of investigative intrusions and sanction from the 1970s onwards, one can find an ecclesiological vision that is very different to that which emerged in 19th century and early 20th century Europe, a vision that was adopted in North America and was consolidated at various points until the ecclesial interruption and revolution of Vatican II, which itself brought a great wave of backlash from those fearful of such a revolution. And we can rehearse at length the fallout from the battle for the council and the reforms of the reform, the clampdown on so many initiatives unleashed by the council, and the policing of theology and ministerial practice in those past several decades. By early 2014, the church was not a happy and uplifting place to dwell in so many parts of the globe in so many ways. And yet, in 2003, at the height of the revelations of the abuse crisis, Peter Fan was calling for that Copernican revolution in ecclesiology. He spoke of how the Catholic Church in Asia, in and of Asia, 
through the Federation of Asian Bishops Conference, has proposed to fulfil the Christian mission of evangelisation through a triple dialogue, as we've heard before, with the poor people of Asia, its cultures and its religions. The triple dialogue being a familiar theme of Fan's works. And yet in Rome today, we see unfolding another ecclesiological revolution in the words, deeds, thought and priorities of Pope Francis. The cardinal electors in 2013 knew the church was not in a good place. They knew it was not a happy place in which to dwell. One cardinal spoke during the pre-conclave discussions and wondered aloud that if Jesus came back to the church today, he would find a door slammed in his face. The cardinal electors agreed and they chose the very brother among them who had raised those doubts about whether Jesus himself would be welcome in the church in 2013 to be the next pope. Pope Francis's revolution has striking parallels with the Copernican revolution called for by Peter Fan in 2003. And it is little wonder, for they share much in common. Both are migrants, or the child of migrants in Pope Francis's case. Both are shaped by and know so well the perspectives and experiences of peoples and their faiths far beyond the Euro-North American world. After all, both come from the global south. Both are acutely attentive to the need to be mindful of the needs of particular contexts and especially of the plight of the poor and marginalized. Both are products of post-Vatican II formation and both are driven by a moral pragmatism oriented towards that concern for the poor and marginalized and oppressed. Both are fully committed to a relentless dialogue with the other, be this in terms of other churches, other faiths, or those of no professed faith. And both are determined that the church structures and doctrines must serve its mission and daily life and not the other way around. Both know all too well the damage wrecked by colonialism, having seen its lasting effects at first hand. Both know that doctrinal details are far less important than social justice and dialogue among differing churches, and both exhibit a non-hierarchical ecclesiology formed by their contexts, and both owe much to liberationist theologies for the shaping of their ecclesiologies. And the similarities do not end there. Both are incredibly grounded. If Pope Francis was the first pope to have worked as a nightclub bouncer, then Peter Fan may be unique, or at least among a tiny select band of theologians, to have worked as a garbage collector. <laughs> and both Jorge Bergoglio and Peter Fan, as I mentioned earlier, were sent to Ireland to improve their English. One of them had a quite higher quality of experience of language learning in the Emerald Isle than the other. <laughs> Perhaps we could say that this is the very first pope to address many of the key insights of the emergence of a truly global church, of world Christianity. And this not just to allow such to influence his own, but also in many instances to bring such insights into church teaching and so effectively to become official church policy. At the heart of Francis's vision for the church is of course that it becomes more a poor church for the poor. And of course this also addresses the context of the global south much more directly than many alternative ecclesiological visions. This is clearly demonstrated in his groundbreaking apostolic exhortation Evangelii Gaudium. Francis's ecclesiology like Peter's, his vision of the church, is one that is no longer by default hierarchical. In fact, one could say the ecclesiology of Francis is very much one that prioritizes the perspective from below. Enculturation is actually endorsed by Francis and even stated as necess uh, necessary. Outdated liturgical mentalities, the imposition of Western cultural forms, outdated wider ecclesial practices and norms and laws are mildly chastised here or fastidiously rejected there. Towards the end of his latest book, available outside for $35, uh, <laughs> Peter Fan speaks about the need for a conversion from fear to joy in the church, and he pays homage to Pope Francis for helping to set such a conversion in motion, not least of all through the titles and focus of some of his own key do uh, teaching documents, The Joy of the Gospel and The Joy of Love. Peter's own latest work, The Joy of Religious Pluralism, does not just pay respect to this conversion, though. It demonstrates the author is someone who was firmly ahead of the ecclesiological game in being converted to the joy that the faith is supposed to bring about long ago. And Peter speaks of such conversion not being easy, nor the product of a theological symposium or learned erudition, but rather the joy of religious pluralism emerges out of the encounter with the religious other, especially when such encounters involve a shared commitment to working on behalf of the poor and marginalized. In an earlier work, Peter Fan spoke of differing tradition and approaches sharing, he said, a common journey, different paths, the same destination. In this latest book, he states that instead of trying to see the religious other as someone to convert, 
to, to our own particular way of thinking, we should rather see them, as Peter quotes, as a fellow traveller on a spiritual journey towards the same goal, than on a different route, with different means of transportation, and with sometimes very different and apparently opposite concepts of what that goal is. Whether it is God or God's, salvation from sin or liberation from suffering, total submission to Allah or loving union with the divine. These theological differences, honestly acknowledged as radically different and not homogenized as merely various ways of speaking about the same thing, can and should be brought to the table in interreligious dialogue so that persons of one faith can learn from other faiths what is missing in their understanding and living of their own faith, to correct defects and decencies of their own and de deficiencies of their own religion, and to share with others their religious insights and practices as humble gifts in deep, deep, deep gratitude for the generous hospitality that the religious ever offers them. This is what it means to do theology without borders. Speaking as a fellow migrant, one twice over, when my family's relocation from a poor island to the UK is added to my own relocation, and perhaps much more importantly today, I have to say that the church, the world of theology, the academy, and above all, the lives of those who come into contact with him are so much all the better for Professor Peter Fan and that theology that transcends all borders. Long may his Copernican revolution in ecclesiology and indeed in theology in general continue. Thank you. Thank you.